Our objectives are to look at the current evidence regarding the use of supplements in primary care pediatric practice, um, recommendations regarding the use of vitamins, probiotics, phytonutrients, and dispel common myths because there's a lot of them about these. They're not regulated, so you've got all kids, uh, parents are doing all kinds of interesting things. So we'll go through what evidence is available um, on these. So just a re re reminder of what nutraceuticals are. They're call also called functional foods. So if you're doing a Google search or if you're doing a literature search, you can search under both topics. Basically, they have medicinal effect on human health. There's actually a journal of medicinal food that does publish research in this area. The categories that are sort of set by the sort of experts in this area is the vitamins and minerals are considered nutraceuticals, fibers, bioactive substances, fatty acids, and the um, probiotics, prebiotics, symbiotics. So what have we got? And I just, I was looking to see if there's anything new and I couldn't find anything new, like new studies really that kind of talked about anything new. So we know for a long time that vitamins, if we don't have certain vitamins, you get sick, right? I mean, they knew about scurvy a long time ago. They figured out scurvy on the ships, right? If they put something with vitamin C, those people didn't get scurvy, right? And vitamin D and rickets, that has been, you know, around for a long time. We par Even parents know you're supposed to have calcium for bones, right? Iron for anemia. Those are sort of the classic. That's what we're talking about here. Um, when we look at um, kids and their intake of supplements, um, most kids do not get adequate calcium, vitamin D, and vitamin E. And 87% um, of preschoolers that did not take a vitamin supplement had inadequate vitamin D intake. So I have a friend that was working at the Shriners Children's Hospital, and she goes, oh, did you know there's a lot of rickets out there? Well, we're living in Oregon. It's north. You know, if, parents, if kids are not drinking milk and they're not getting vitamin D supplement, they will get rickets. So we do need to pay attention to that. <clears throat> anyway, so that's a, that's a 80, that was from 2012. 40% uh, of preschoolers, 20% of toddlers, um, they get vitamin mineral supplements. Um, this is a large um, study, the FIT study. Um, and so, so people are giving some of their kids some vitamins, not all of them. I think the toddlers are the ones that probably need, they're one of the eat, worst eaters of all that group. Um, there's a 2013 study of prevalence. Um, if you look at herbs and uh, other supplements, about almost 4% of kids are, are, have done something in the past 30 days. A lot of them have done echinacea. Uh, they've done uh, fish oils some sort of other herb pill, probiotics, melatonin. So, you know, parents are giving their kids um, these data. Now, let me tell you about this health surveys. Do you see where it says 2007? Do you realize it takes like about five years after they do the surveys for this stuff to get in the literature? It, you're always this huge delay. So we don't know what's happening right now. We know what's happening about five, six years ago because that's just the way it takes. It take, they have to do the studies and they have to bring it all back and then they have to, you know, it takes just a while to even get to the data. I was um, at a meeting the other day and the, early, the latest data we could get was the 2010, 2011 and these are from the people who own the data. So it's, it's it's really, um, it's, you're always a little delayed on this. Vitamin A. So let's look at, we're going to work our way through the vitamins sort of alphabetically because the, to sort of talk out what the evidence says. So vitamin A, there is evidence for use in um, very low, extremely low birth weight preemies um, for using and um, that it, it does help them. There is some use, uh, evidence for use in diarrhea in third world countries. So if, um, if they're for disadvantaged and um, have poor nutrition already, they probably could use vitamin A. There's not evidence for here in the US. Our kids probably get enough of that. Women who are pregnant in uh, developing countries, um, you know, they have vitamin A deficiency, which means their babies are probably have vitamin A deficiency and they're breastfed, they probably have vitamin A deficiency. So it does make sense. It, kids with cystic fibrosis, there's something, you know, they, they metabolize everything differently. So either they're metabolizing the vitamin A differently or they're, there's some sort of 
part of their genetic piece of the, the um, cystic fibrosis, but they have uh, low vitamin A levels. So if we think about vitamin A, most of our kids don't need supplementation. They probably get plenty from the diet. Um, and they don't, uh, and patients with cystic fibrosis and children and pregnant women from developing countries. But so vitamin A, you know, um, you know we're, we probably don't need to worry about that here. Vitamin B2 is um, uh, mixed evidence around using it for migraines in kids. You'll see one study that says to use it. You see another study that says it doesn't work. We go back and forth. If you ask the pediatric neurologist, some of them are using it, some of them aren't. It probably doesn't hurt. There is a pediatric formula of Mig Relief, which has feverfew, magnesium, and riboflavin. And um, so it is probably not going to hurt a kid to get this if they have really bad migraines. And really, you don't have a lot of choice in young kids because you can't use the triptans in young kids. And so you got propranolol. So it wouldn't hurt to do a trial of um, vitamin B2 or riboflavin. Um, there is some. There is a study from 2010 that says that there was a 50% reduction. So you know it's really inconclusive because, like a lot of things, you have one study that says they do it, another study that doesn't. It's not going to hurt them. Probably okay. Vitamin B6. Um, there are certain groups that are at risk for vitamin D, B6 or folate in, inadequacy, people with impaired renal function, autoimmune disorders. Um, what we're going to see is those patients that are um, vegans, you know, they're, or they're not wanting to, they're not taking all these things. Vitamin B6, we see that, or actually vegans is vitamin B12, sorry, reduce that. Um, so we do have certain people, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, they're at risk for vitamin B6 inadequacy. Most people do fine. Uh, there is a study that says vitamin B6 at 80 milligrams a day reduces PMS symptoms. So, you know, if you have a teenager that's having a lot of problems with that, vitamin B, it's a water-soluble vitamin. You can't get toxins. You're going to pee it out so you can try it. It doesn't hurt. Um, and they give it in nausea, vomiting, and pregnancy. Um, one, uh, the thing is that infants that have vitamin B6 deficiency can be irritable and have um, uh, seizures. So we do want to think about, you know, what's, you know, are they getting adequate amounts? And they, I mean, if they're breastfed, they should be fine. If they're formula they should be fine. Um, patients on uh, seizure medicines all should be supplemented because they have a deficit. So if you have kids that are on valproic acid, carbamazepine, or phenytoin, they should get a vitamin B supplement. Um, and, you know, they don't say exactly how much. I would make sure that they're taking a daily multiple vitamin because they have B6 in it. And um, what, so that they're at least getting the recommended amount there because um, there's not really a recommendation of how much extra to give them. Let me see. Sorry, i got to grab my notes. This, this screen is not letting me see all my notes. Um, page 9, there's something else here. Apologize here, just a second. All right. What else about B6? It cut off the end. Um, oh, exclusively breastfed. Um, oh, that's, sorry. Okay, here we go. Uh, so we've got carbamazepine, phenytoin. Um, oh, what they do is they increase the catabolism of the vitamin C, B6. So, so we do need to make sure they're on a supplement if they're on any of these um, uh, anti-seizure medicines, okay? All right, B12. Here we go. So B12 is where you get megablastic anemia, megablastic anemia. Um, if they're deficit. Now, some people genetically have a B12 deficiency. That can happen. Um, so we do have to watch um, for, it's part of, you have to think about that if you've got a kid with, or an infant with failure to thrive, developmental delays, um, if you have kids with uh, weight loss, poor memory, sort of think about this, especially if they're strict vegans and vegetarians. 
they might not be getting enough vitamin B12. And you know, these teenagers, you know, their idea of vegetarianism is kind of wanky. You know, it's sort of like, okay, let's just have salad. I'll, I eat salad all the time. I'm a vegetarian. They don't understand they have to have this sort of all the nutrients. And so like a really like well-rounded vegetarian makes sure that all of these different um, nutrients, they get them in their diet. But you know, you get these teenagers and they just want to be a vegan. Okay. A vegan doesn't mean they only eat vegetables. They have to figure out how they're getting those proteins and those other things. So B12, um, they have to do this. If moms are strict vegetarians or vegans, um, their babies need to be supplemented with B12 because they're um, not going to, uh, they're personally not going to get enough, and then their infants are going to be having deficits. And so... Those are the groups for sure to, that need B12 um, supplementation. And um, this stuff, you can buy it orally. If people have a true B12 deficiency, what they usually recommend is you give it IM, um, and then you can go to high dose oral. Uh, so, if, if, so people that develop megaplastic anemia, that's a very different protocol than just giving them some vitamins with B12. And um, so those people you want to, it's different than what is, I'm talking about here. Yes? Yeah, for their kids. So goat's milk doesn't have any B12 in it. Yeah. So you just have to really, you know, ask people what they're doing because these kids can get really, really sick if they are not getting B12. And what you're going to see is a kid with failure to thrive and developmental delays. And so we do need it, and if they're not getting adequate amounts, they need to supplement. Um, vitamin B, vitamin C. Uh, so Linus Pauling went to Oregon State. I, w I went to Oregon State. You know, he was he was big there. Um, so anyway, this is um, we know that certain groups are at risk for vitamin C inadequacy, not necessarily def deficiency. But we know smokers actually need more. So if any of your teenagers are smoking, we don't have good data on secondary smoke. So do the kids of smokers that sort of live in these houses that get all the secondary smoke, do they need more vitamin C? We don't know. They get a lot of colds. Do they get a lot of colds because they get the smoke exposure? Who knows? Infants that get evaporated or boiled milk, hopefully nobody's doing that. But, you know, they don't. there's no vitamin C there. Um, and then kids with, here we go, limited food variety. How's that? So what about our patients that they do the fast food diet and they never get any fresh fruits or vegetables? They probably have inadequate vitamin C intake, unless they're drinking a lot of juice. And then people with malabsorption disorders. So those are the people that truly have vitamin C issues, and we need to um, uh, think about those people as needing supplementation. <coughs> My voice is going. i got another hour and a half here. <coughs> Another hour and 20, 10 minutes. Okay, so um, there's a lot of claims about vitamin C. The, there are some studies that look at um, asthma scores, a little bit of vitamin C. Uh, 200 milligrams isn't very much. Improved bene asthma scores. Um, there is one study, a small study, that says kids with autism have lower vitamin C levels. So it probably wouldn't hurt those kids to get some vitamin C. You know, um, it's, it, but really there's no good evidence for colds or lead poisoning or anything like that. There's a newer study that looked at vitamin C and SSRIs, and this was a RCT, and, oh, thanks. Um, that, I was out of water, good. And so what they looked at is they looked at fluoxetine of 10 to 20 milligrams a day, and... Um, and they combined it with a placebo, and they combined it with vitamin C, and they actually had better depression scores or lower depression scores if they had vitamin C plus their fluoxetine. So maybe um, kids that are on SSRIs could get some vitamin C too. And so the study was 1,000 milligrams a day. Um, that, and, you know, that's another water-soluble vitamin. It won't hurt them until we get bigger studies and have some guidelines around that. So if parents ask you, but it wouldn't hurt. I just say you need to take a vitamin every day. All these kids need it. It just helps, okay? Um, but uh, the, probably the kids on SSRIs need a little bit more than just the regular multivitamin amount. Um, vitamin D, we have guidelines from the AAP. Everybody's supposed to be on it. How are your parents doing with this one? Are they giving the kids their vitamin D drops? 
I try to explain to people, we live in the Northwest. You know, it's the Northwest. It's, you know, we don't get, the kids go out in the sun, and then when they go out, we put sunscreen on them. So they need to have their vitamin D. We know everybody's supposed to get 400 units a day, and if they're not drinking 32 ounces a day of vitamin D milk, then they need to um, get supplemented. But when they do studies, they're finding that most of the time, our infants are not meeting their daily requirement, and um, that the pediatricians, not the PNPs, but the pediatricians are not filing, following the guidelines. <laughs> I like that. Blame it on the pediatricians. <laughs> okay, so um, clearly we have lactating women and their infants in the northern states are the ones that are vitamin D deficient because we don't get enough sun. There, I, I went to the Western Institute of Nursing. There was a great nursing study done that someone did for their PhD. They gave a high dose vitamin D really high dose vitamin D to pregnant women and monitored mom's levels and the infant's levels. And even then, and even during keeping high dose during lactation, those babies were not getting enough. So we really do need to make sure that those babies are getting their vitamin D. I, and I'm waiting for that to come out in publication. This was sort of a presentation last April. So I'm waiting for that to be published because I want to add that to my talk because she was really systematically measuring serum levels. Um, there is some evidence around vitamin D preventing influenza, giving kids 1,200 IUs during flu season, daily during flu season. They found they got less flu. Um, there are fewer exacerbations of their uh, asthma in the study group. It's a lot of vitamin D. I guess if you're only giving it during flu season, you know, uh, it's probably okay, but that's quite a bit of vitamin D, a little bit more than that's recommended. Um, when they look at HIV-infected children, 3 to 18 years of age, 85% were vitamin D deficient um, or insufficient. And um, so what they found is that they did increase their vitamin D levels if they gave them supplements. And um, even with incomplete adherence, they still got about 40% of them up into the normal range. So um, they recommend 800 IUs a day for HIV-infected kids. Vitamin D and asthma. Um, vitamin D has some immunomodulating properties, so it would make sense that kids with low vitamin D might have some problems with more inflammatory issues in their lungs. And so there have been multiple studies that show that um, if kids with low vitamin D levels have increased amount of asthma. And um, I was talking to one of the peds pulmonology people. She's a PNP who works in peds pulmonology. They're putting the kids on um, vitamin D, making sure they're getting adequate amounts. Um, the other thing, too, is if you're getting them on oral corticosteroids, we've known this for a long time, oral corticosteroids reduce vitamin D levels. So there you've got, if you've got them on, but we don't know what inhaled corticosteroids do. So once again, we need to get them on adequate amounts of vitamin D. Um, do we need extra? Probably, we don't know. Um, but definitely make sure they're getting at least their four to 800 a day that is recommended. Um, so, you know, the reason that makes sense to me is that what vitamin D does, it improves eosinophil infection, it inhibits fibrotic, me uh, some of the fibrotic me mediators of that remodeling of the airway that could happen. And so, um, uh, if you've got your asthmatic kids, make sure they're doing their vitamin D. Okay, ask everybody, are you giving your kid your vitamin D every day? Or are they drinking milk? Because a lot of these kids aren't drinking milk or they can't tolerate milk. So we need to make sure, or they're doing almond milk or they're doing coconut milk or they're doing all these other things. And a lot of those don't have the vitamin D in it. They put vitamin D in milk originally because every kid drank it. Okay, so we need to make sure they're getting vitamin D if they're not drinking milk. All right, adherence. So... This is an interesting study just study published recently. Who takes it? Well, if the parents take it, the kids take it. So this is a study that found higher adherence in the children if the parents also take vitamin D supplements. I take vitamin D in the winter. In the summer, I'm out walking all the time, so I don't have to worry about it. But I mean, so I can see, well, that makes sense. I remember to take mine. I remember to, here you go, everybody take your vitamins. I even text my kids. My son's in school in Chicago. I text him, did you take your vitamins? You know, he's 20. <laughs> I don't think, I'll hopefully at some point I'll stop, you know, but you take your vitamins. Um, because, you know, I know that he's not out in the sun for months and I worry about this. He has, he has intermittent asthma. 
So the found, this study found that there was a higher incidence of adherence if there was a shared responsibility between the child and the parent to remember to take the vitamin D. So there you go. That's how you get them to take it. Get the parent to take it. People worry about vitamin D as a fat-soluble vitamin. You got to give a lot of it to be toxic. So they had these seven kids that were admitted for vitamin D toxicity. They were hypercalcemic. And so what they found is there was this fish oil that had 4,000 times it was a mistake in the manufacturing. 4,000 times the recommended amount of vitamin D. So the risk for rickets is much higher than the risk for vitamin D toxicity. So just get, make sure the parents are giving it. Don't have to monitor it if they're giving the recommended amount. Um, you do want to consider doing vitamin D levels, though, on kids with depression. You want to consider doing with asthma and stuff if you're, not, if you're worried. It's okay. The one thing a vitamin D level is going to give you is evidence that says you have to take your vitamins. Okay? Or it's going to say you're doing okay. So... Um, you know, it, I think more and more people are doing, are you guys, who's doing vitamin D levels? Yeah, I, I mean, we, we're doing them more and more. It used to be kind of hokey not to do them, and now we're just finding it's, you know, a lot of kids are deficit. They do have a deficit. So give them their vitamin D. Fiber. Fiber is another probiotic. We all know about fiber. It has prebiotic effects. It promotes satiety, reduces glycemic index, Okay. There are recommended fiber intakes by two different groups. One group is the AAP, these guys. This is their, um, uh, in, was published in pediatrics. What they say is kids need somewhere between five to seven grams per kilogram, okay? Or if you go by age, 11 um, to 13 for one to three year olds. And if you get 14 to 18 year olds, 24 to 33. So um, there are some recommended amounts of fiber. Most kids aren't getting that. If you look at the a American Heart Association, they actually, the reason they have fiber guidelines is because they are um, concerned about cardiovascular disease and they want to make sure everybody gets adequate fiber because they find that people have lower cardiovascular disease. Their guidelines are a little bit higher. They're saying 19 grams of fiber for one to three year olds. That's a lot of fiber. So, so if you look at the fiber cereals and you look at like frosted mini wheats, I think there's five grams of fiber in a cup. So that's a lot of frosted mini wheats or whatever they're eating because, you know, that's a, you got to get a lot of fiber in to get that much in. So um, most kids actually are only getting about 10 grams a day at that age. So they need to double. Every kid pretty much needs to double from what they, when they do studies of what kids are actually taking. When we look at 6 to 10-year-olds, they're getting about 12 to 13 grams a day. And 12 to 19-year-olds are getting 13 to 15 grams a day. So whatever the kids are doing, just tell them to double it and they'll get enough fiber. Okay. They know fiber cookies. They have all kinds of interesting ways to get fiber chewy gum, gummy chews. Fiber and constipation. We already talked about the guidelines that say not to use it for um, functional constipation, but does it prevent fiber? Const does it prevent constipation? Well, they say if kids with increased fiber content are not as likely to get constipated. Kids with increased fiber content don't need as many laxatives, but there's nothing that says if we give kids fiber, they don't get constipated. So isn't that weird, right? I think we just, kids need fiber. It doesn't hurt them. They can do a Metamucil. They can do, uh, if they want to, there's Metamucil cookies. Those, those actually taste pretty good. I tried them once just to see. Um, it doesn't hurt them with breakfast or whatever. They're not eating anything else. If they're going to eat cookies, they might eat something that's healthy, right? Um, they, kids with increased fiber intake are less likely to get obese. Well, that makes sense. You're filling them up with the less calories. They're not as new, you know, they have a lot of bulk. And so that would make sense. In, low fibers associated with increased body fat. Um, there are some studies looking at using psyllium in kids with dyslipidemia and diabetes and um, looking at psyllium for um, decreasing LDLs and triglycerides, and they recommend um, that National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute re guidelines recommends using psyllium, 6 grams a day for 2 to 12-year-olds that have increased LDL or decreased LDL and increased triglycerides. Um, and also kids with dyslipidemia, do you also want to use uh, plant sterols, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So they say water-soluble fiber and plant sterols. Because, you know, the medicines, the statins, 
aren't approved for young kids, and they're kind of scary for adults long term. So we certainly want to try safer, you know, I'd rather do give a kid fiber than a statin, okay? All right, so in conclusion, kids are probably not getting enough. The American Heart Association says we need to give it to kids, and we need to, maybe it prevents constipation. We need to do some studies along that, and maybe, maybe it helps prevent obesity. But, you know, look, if kids are eating fruits and vegetables, they're probably getting more fiber, and they're probably not getting as obese. That's where our big problem is. They need to eat more whole grains and fruits and vegetables, not psyllium, you know. They just need to eat normal food, not McDonald's chicken nuggets and fries. That There's a little fiber in there. It's very little fiber. Okay. Um, cholesterol and lipids. So this was the American Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute that had 2012 guidelines. And they looked at autopsy studies, vascular studies, and cohort studies that says abnormal lipid levels in childhood are associated with increased evidence of atherosclerosis. Well, duh. You know, I mean, it totally makes sense. But I think what we didn't think about is kids are at highest risk as adults. So we really need to pay attention. How many of you guys are um, doing lipids at 5? 10? 10 to 12? Everybody's doing lipids at 10 to 12? With this? Yeah, we're, that's when we're doing it. Okay. So 5 is where the, par the parents that have hyper, the, the familial hypocholesteremia, hypo you might consider doing it at 5. So... Um, the expert panel says recommends screening everybody at 9 to 11 years, which parents are just shocked. How many parents go, what? Why are you taking their cholesterol? They're a kid. Well, because it's a problem. You know, we have to check them, make sure that they're not having. This is a screening test. If they're normal, they're good for five years. Okay. Um, so there's recommendations of what are normals in kids, and those are in the guidelines. Um, and... So we kind of want to think about, we want to keep them, um, their total cholesterol less than 170. Plant sterols have been around for about uh, 15 or 20 years. These are great. The um, plant sterols are basically plant compounds that have a chemical structure and biological functions similar to cholesterol, but they, so you don't, you don't, you, you actually lower the uh, cholesterol with it. We have it in our diets, like nuts and seeds and grains and all that. But there's also these fortified spreads and milk with it and different things. So um, they actually do work to lower cholesterol. Um, when they do studies, they um, if uh, kids get 1.6 to 2 grams a day, they reduce the LDL 10 to 15% in kids, 6 to 18 years. Basically, you know, if they want to spread butter on stuff, they should just get the margarine and use it. It's kind of spendy. It's like really spendy, actually. But um, uh, they, they can use that. in. Um, and then what they really recommend in these kids is use it for up to two grams a day of replacement for their fat sources. So all they shouldn't be using any regular butter or margarine. They should be using the ones with plant sterols in it, um, especially if the family has familial hypercholesterolemia. The parents probably should be doing it too, right? There's lots of things out there that contain the plant sterols. Benicol, um, there's Take Control, there's a orange juice from Minute Maid that has um, plant sterols in it. There's um, some breads that have uh, plant sterols in it. So, you know, whatever works. Um, but basically, you know, it really is, there's five randomized controlled trials when the, they made this, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute guidelines, they say, you know, they work, so use them. They are just kind of spinny. My husband uses Benicol. He laughed at me. He's an internist. When these first, the information first came out, he hadn't really studied this, and I said, just, he's, his cholesterol was up. I said, just use the Benicol. It'll work. And he goes, oh, you know, so he did, and guess what? Six months later, his cholesterol came down, and now he tells all his parents, patients to do it, too, because it really is, it's a very easy way. If you use your margarine, you just spread it on. It tastes fine. It tastes like margarine, so um, it works great. Kids take it. Um, my kids think it tastes better than margarine, so, and they don't have high cholesterol. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, um, so that's, so there is evidence. So go ahead and do the plant sterols, or we can eat our nuts and seeds, which is the other thing that's recommended. Um, fatty acids and fish oils. So the omega-3s are in fish, and the omega-6s are in the vegetable oils and nuts and seeds. The American Heart Association says fish twice a week. 
um, and try to get 5 to 7 percent of your diet as omega-6s. The National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute um, says to, they don't give an amount, they just say for kids to increase the dietary fish intake. But you got to be careful because some of these fish, like tuna, are not good for that much. So you have to be careful of what fish they're eating as we say increase fish intake. Um, there was a long-term study done of women in Europe at three different centers where they gave women increased omega-3s during their pregnancy to see if it made any difference in kids' cognition, and it didn't. Long-term studies said it really doesn't make a difference, um, and so that kind of went away. You know, they, there was some idea, you know, many years ago, but when they follow these kids long-term, after birth, up to age five, they didn't make any difference. Um, dyslexic kids, there's a very, very small study on dyslexic kids that um, um, they increased their reading scores when they did uh, omega-3 fatty acid supplements. It was, um, how many kids? There weren't very many, 20. So it needs basically what they need is a bigger study. And not only that, the study was eight fish oil capsules a day. <laughs> I know, how are you gonna get a kid to take fish, that much fish oil capsules? So they gotta figure out a better way to get it in if they're going to do this. Yes? Coconut oil, I don't think we have a good RCT. Right, I know it has, it's a good source, but we don't have a, um, Oh, I'd have to look at the breakdown of that. I know it is, it does have, I think it's, it would be omega-3s because that's the one that's in the plant source. I mean, omega-6s is the plant, omega-3s is the fish. I was thinking that it might be under the 6. Yeah, it's a 6. Yeah. The fish has got the 3s. So, um, anyway, we need to do some studies because coconut, coconut is great because that's, it tastes good and we can do that. There was a big uh, systematic review in 2011 that we looked at 10 trials of almost 700 kids and another 13 trials of 1,100 kids. Um, and so um, there is a uh, some improvement in ADHD scores if they get enough omega-3 fatty acids um, in one study. And then another study says there's little evidence for using omega-6s and 3s combined for ADHD. <sighs> What do you do with that? Like, you know, if, so what I would do is if the parents say, I hear that if I give my kid omega threes, that ADHD may be better. I'm like, oh, well, there's some evidence for that. It may or may not work. It won't probably hurt them, you know? Um, certainly they could use some more fish and nuts in their diet, right? I wouldn't give them eight fish oil capsules a day. That probably isn't evidence for that, but so there isn't, it's, it, it's very inconclusive. I wish it were better. So basically, you want to make sure they get enough um, uh, foods that contain these first. Avoid the high mercury fish, which are um, shark, shortfish, king mackerel, or tilefish. Tuna, the um, light chunk tuna doesn't have as much. Um, there is some possible benefit for kids with dyslexia or ADHD. Like I said, we need more studies. Prebiotics, probiotics. Um, these are these non-pathogenic bacteria. Okay, they're all normally in the gut, and uh, there are foods that um, have uh, uh, prebiotics in them. Um, symbiotics are kind of a mixture of prebiotics. And, um, well, it's prebiotics actually get digested into make probiotics in the gut. So there's pretty strong evidence for use of probiotics for gastroenteritis um, and diarrhea. This is really interesting because like I've been doing this for a long time. I'm glad they finally have some studies that show this. Um, but we, we were pretty, it's pretty clear that with gastroenteritis, you shorten the, by about 24 hours. Um, and also if you're treating Giardia, you can give the probiotics with the metronidazole. It also shortens the course of diarrhea for that. Um, antibiotic associated diarrhea, um, it shortens the amount of, it decreases the amount of antibiotic associated diarrhea. 
and the, the, you know, they're all on the number to need to treat. The number need to treat is pretty low. So, you know, I've been telling people my whole 21 years as a PNP to give their kids yogurt while they're on antibiotics. Now I go, go buy the drops or the capsules or whatever, and actually I just put it as part of the prescription. It's over the counter, but our pharmacy carries it. Um, uh, all these antibiotics are not good for these kids' guts, and it does help. Uh, the they did do a study looking at um, uh, healthcare associated diarrhea, and this was in the um, Pediatric Infectious Disease Journal, and um, basically it reduced it, but they needed more to treat, and it wasn't as significant. It was only one strain, and so not as clear as like plant gastroenteritis and antibiotic associated diarrhea. Uh, there's some thought that maybe we need to supplement kids. Every initially, just put it in the formula, you know, just like put some probiotics in there, prebiotics. I think some of the formulas are some of the formulas doing that. Yeah. So. Um, uh, you know, they think maybe it decreases URIs or pneumonia. Probably decreases colic, maybe or maybe not. Who knows? Uh, and um, so, uh, what they say is that what they're doing is there is some prebiotic effects of breast milk. So if we put these into formula, they're going to get some of the same beneficial effects to their gut as breast milk. Uh, I don't think we'll ever get exactly what breast milk does, but um, Possibly there's um, some overall reduction in infectious disease. Um, but once again, you have one study that says it works, one study says it doesn't. These are pretty benign for the most part. Um, one of the things is if you're doing H. pylori treatment, um, you want to add probiotics to the triple therapy because it does help in adults. And there's been one small trial in kids that, that seems to say it works. So go ahead and um, with those kids. But remember, they're on antibiotics anyway, cause we're, and so we're supposed to give kids on antibiotics, probiotics anyway, so that would make sense. Um, URIs, this is really interesting. Um, it, there was a, a Cochrane review in 2015 that just, just published, brand new. They looked at 13 randomized controlled trials, and they, 12 of them they could use. They found probiotics were better than placebo in URIs. So you get fewer episodes of URIs, shorter duration, fewer need, lower need for antibiotics, um, and it's all statistically significant on the um, Cochrane Review. So, you know, that's interesting, right? Um, Fewer cold-related missed school days. Um, once again, it's a fairly benign substance. I, I don't know if we're going to come out and say every kid needs to take probiotics all the way through the winter, but if a parent comes to you and says, should I give my kids probiotics to prevent colds? I would say, why not? We can see if it works, because there certainly is some evidence that shows that it does work. Um, so... They've done some work with preemies and looked at probiotics. Uh, this was a little scary because now you're introducing bacteria into an immunocompromised patient, and um, they're pretty brave to do this. Um, they looked at uh, it, po it, um, it may reduce the incidence of neck in those little teeny preemies and no increase in increased incidence of adverse effects. Um, but it doesn't work in short bowel syndrome. So, um, uh, and they did have a case of lactobacillus septus in kids with short bowel syndrome. So they're kind of looking at it with all this GI stuff. Um, there's another 2015 study looking at lactoferrin, which is a normal component of human colostrum in milk and enhances the host defense. And, um, and they're saying, thinking that it, that is what is preventing sepsis and neck in preterm babies. Um, and so uh, they're um, doing oral lactoferrin prophylaxis with and without probiotics um, to decrease um, sepsis. And so this is a brand new study. Um, they're looking at 6,000 preterm infants 
and they are still reviewing all the evidence of that. So um, this is kind of an exciting thing because that's a pretty big study. We should get some good data out of it. But um, hopefully um, this is going to, it's, it's um, maybe it's going to help us prevent neck, neck in these preemies. Probiotics for colic, we already talked about this. It works or it doesn't work, depending on what you read, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, probably won't hurt them. Um, probiotics for atopic derm, uh, there is some evidence of moms using it prenatally. Uh, there's less evidence for kids once they're born to give them probiotics. So I don't know what's going on prenatally. If you give moms probiotics, why co those kids are getting less atopic derm. We need more studies in that area. Um, so I know I whipped kind of through that, but I do want to get a chance to finish everything up. Do you have any questions? I went to Sydney last year. Yes? <laughs> no. No, they're sort of like the kids' dose. You know, so there's the cultural kids' drops. That's sort of what people are using. The um, cultural, once they hit one year, they get the full capsule adult dose. So it's a pretty broad range. Yeah. There are some children pediatric formulas, though. Um, so I'm going to just switch out. If you need to stand up and stretch, go ahead while I figure out.